All right, it is 12 o'clock. We are going to get started. Good afternoon. My name is Annie Mons. I'm the project manager for the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Welcome to the April Ethics Grand Rounds. For those of you who need the C CME CE credit, please use this text information. Let me, sorry, I'm trying to multitask. It's not working. There we go. Certificates are sent out approximately 30 days after the lecture. You will get an email tomorrow with an evaluate code for an evaluation. We do like to have those filled out just to help us um, as we continue to find topics and speakers for our grand rounds. The today's grand rounds is being recorded and will be available on our website within a few days after the after the lecture is over. This today we are excited to bring back uh, the annual Dr. Margaret Gaffney lecture on humanism and medicine. We began this lecture a few years ago to honor Dr. Gaffney's outstanding work as a professor, ethicist, and mentor, and the significant contribution she's made to the ethics community. The Q&A box will be available, as always, to post questions throughout the lecture. We may not always answer them right away, but we will um, when Professor Hartsock is ready for the Q&A portion today. Professor Hartsock has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. She is the System Director of Clinical and Organizational Ethics for IU Health, a faculty investigator with the IU SM Center for Bioethics, and an adjunct assistant professor of medical humanities and health studies at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Jane completed her law degree at Indiana University's Robert H. McKinney School of Law in 2002, where she focused her coursework on medical legal issues and completed a year-long clerkship with a malpractice defense firm here in Indianapolis. After completion of her law degree and admission to the Illinois State Bar, Jane embarked on a career in healthcare litigation, primarily defending hospitals, clinicians, and long-term care facilities in Chicago, Illinois. Jane's legal, legal career provided her with substantial experience in multiple jurisdictions throughout the country, exposing her to a variety of cultural and ideological differences in attitudes towards health, illness, and medicine, which inform her approach to clinical ethics. These interests ultimately led Jane to pursue a, pursue a master's in philosophy and bioethics and a graduate certificate in medical humanities and health studies, which she completed in the spring of 2017. In 2016, she also completed the Fairbanks Fellowship in Clinical Ethics here at FCME. Jane's primary areas of interest are transplant ethics, law and medicine, and narrative ethics. Please welcome Professor Jane Hartsock. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, or I guess afternoon, barely. So um, this discussion will present Dr. Claire Frazier, a nurse and surgeon and the protagonist of, Di of uh, Diana Gabaldon's series of novels, Outlander, as a depiction of the application of Humean ethical theory to clinical medical ethics. Um, as Annie mentioned, this lecture is part of the annual Dr. Margaret Gaffney Lecture on Humanism in Medicine. Um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Gaffney, she is one of the founders of the ethics program at Indiana University Health. Um, she has a BA in English literature, and so she is close to my heart. Um, and she brought humanism to her own medical practice here in Indianapolis, where she continues to teach ethics to medical students, ethics fellows, and residents. She is a model physician and a personal hero to really anyone who knows her. She is also my friend and my neighbor. Um, and so I am sorry my dog is always barking. She just wants to be friends. So get started here. All right, I have no uh, financial conflicts of interest to disclose. All right. So today's talk is an extension of a talk I'll be giving at the University of Glasgow in July. I only have 10 minutes for that, but I have you all for an hour, so buckle up. Um, we are going to describe the Humean concept of emotivism uh, within the context of metaethics, compare and contrast Hume's concept of sympathy with the principalist ethics uh, framework, and then apply Hume's sympathy to the, to the depiction of the treatment of patients by Claire Randall, the protagonist of the 1991 novel Outlander. Um, and I hope that today will be fun. Uh, you will smile and laugh and maybe blush just a bit. 
Uh, but ultimately, what David Hume tasks us with is no small matter. And so today's lecture will be uh, hopefully received with a smile and perhaps a tear to borrow from Charlie Chaplin. Uh, okay, so I know there are not very many of you in here and I, I, there's no way to judge online, but how many of you have read these books or a book? Okay, one, two. Okay, all right, I'll take it, I'll take it. Um, all right, so to understand Hume, uh, Gregory, and ultimately, for my book readers, you'll like this. Dr. Claire Elizabeth Beecham Randall Fraser, Randall Fraser Gray Fraser RN, uh, who is the protagonist of Outlander, we have to first understand just a little bit about the Scottish Enlightenment. All right. So um, the Scottish Enlightenment was a historical period of cultural change running from roughly 1730 or so to 1820. This is a, a statue of um, David Hume. Um, its epicenter was Edinburgh, and it was shaped by thinkers such as Adam Smith, Francis Hutcheson, Thomas Reed, and as we were talking about today, Hume. While the Continental Enlightenment found its central appeal being one to reason and rationalism, the Scottish Enlightenment appealed to skepticism and empiricism, which is to say it appealed to experience, to things that can be observed and sensed. It involved an effort to develop reliable beliefs, not self-evident truths. And its central thesis can be found in the distinction between rationalism, which is the view that the world is inherently logical and its truths can be known, and empiricism, which is the view that knowledge comes largely from sense experience and must be tested. The Scottish Enlightenment was largely secular. It rejected the authority of sacred texts but was not hostile to religious beliefs. It also did not rely on aristocratic patronage as was a feature in France, but instead relied on the existing educated population in Scotland. So it bore some similarity to the American and continental enlightenments, but the Scots approached things just a little differently as Scots are wont to do. So David Hume is one of the defining thinkers of the Scottish Enlightenment. In keeping with the established features, actually as someone who defined those features um, of the Scottish Enlightenment, Hume was an empiricist and a skeptic. His seminal treatise on his ethical theory is a treatise of human nature in which he first articulates his emotivist theory of morality. Hume departs from a lot of subsequent ethical theorists by arguing that ethical judgments that is statements that contain ethical terms such as good, bad, right, wrong, ought, ought not, can never be true or false. His reason for this is his contention that humans are constructed of two constitutive, constitutive principles, instincts or passions and reasons, and reason, sorry. He argues, though, that instinct is stronger than reason. Because morals concern action and volition, those things one ought to do or ought not to do, reasons cannot give rise to them, instinct does, the passions do. Consequently, when one says that something is wrong, when I say something like stealing is wrong, that is not a statement that is true or false. It is simply to say that when I contemplate the act of stealing, I am motivated against it. I am moved in some way against it. So the value of a moral judgment is that it guides our conduct. At the core of Hume's moral sense is the notion of sympathy or what we would probably call empathy today. Sympathy is what allows us both to cast judgment of the conduct of others that is, we feel unpleasant or disapproving of another's character, as well as what motivates us towards a concern for others. Otherwise, Hume's ethics would exist in a kind of subjective vacuum, where because there's no objective morality, and because to say something is bad is to say one is as an individual displeased with it, motivated against it, uh, you're left acting in a way that pleases only you, um, which seems a little selfish, and so then not terribly ethically sound. 
But how does sympathy work for Hume? How does an impression of another person, their character, their conduct, their suffering, affect oneself in a world in which reason is the slave to passion? For this, we may start a little bit more simply. All right, so this is uh, Hume's treatise and his two constitutive principles, morals concerning action and volition can never produce action or give rise. Okay, all right. So according to Hume, we come to know the world through a series of impressions and ideas. One forms an impression of something, a sunset, for example, when it is experienced by one or more of the five senses. This impression is an immediate, immediate unmediated experience of the world. So for Hume, when you look at a sunset, it's as if the sunset is kind of pressing against you and you have a, a sort of immediate impression or experience of it. Ideas then are the concepts under which impressions are routinely sorted and classified which then provide us with some knowledge of the world. But Hume argues that the experience of sympathy takes a slightly different form. The process of developing sympathy in Hume's view requires what he refers to as the double relation of impressions and ideas. So in the case of a sunset, you have a single relation, an impression, and then an idea. But with sympathy, again, what we would recognize today as empathy, this process, this relation happens twice in a kind of double back. One sees another suffering and has the impression of them suffering. One derives this impression from the bodily cues, the tormented face, the tears, the obvious human suffering. And that hits you before you have language for it. From this, you are able to reflect and form a kind of cognitive position. And you form the idea of suffering. You sort, you categorize. I recognize this as suffering. In the second relation, from the idea of the suffering of another person, one recognizes the idea of that same sort of distress or pain or suffering in oneself as if to say, that could be me. One then has the impression of oneself suffering, literally. It's important to understand that Hume's concept of sympathy is not the articulation of an analogy. It is a kind of transference. He states, the minds of men are mirrors to one another. Presumably, he means women too. We literally feel discomfort we literally feel pain. We literally suffer because we understand those around us are suffering. And so by extension, the only way we can end our own pain, our own suffering, is to alleviate the suffering of those around us. So to summarize, moral judgments have no cognitive content for Hume. They are not subject to lo logic, rationality, or reason. They have no truth value. What they do have is intrinsic motivation. So if one finds something is wrong, one is motivated to stop it. If you are not motivated to stop it, you don't actually believe that it's wrong. So you can see that at least in a theoretical way, Hume appears difficult to employ. How does one do Humean ethics? And there seem to be some real issues, at least by contemporary standards, in employing an ethical theory that holds as one of its central tenets that ethical judgments can't be true. For example, if an ethical judgment can't be true, we can't punish people who behave in line with that, um, with that ethically uh, uh, disfavored um, behavior. It's for this reason, the apparent unoperationalizability of Hume, that he seems to be omitted as serious theory for applied ethicists, for applied bioethicists, for clinical ethicists. So 
We turn now to the prevailing theory of clinical ethics. This will be familiar to many of you, the four principles, elegant, discreet, subject to reason, or at least claims of such. Beecham and Childress are the architects of the so-called four principles approach that dominates contemporary clinical ethics. And even they urge a cautious approach to compassion. They suggest detached concern or compassionate detachment as alternatives. They argue that Hume is important to the concept of beneficence within the four principles. However, those of us familiar with the teaching of clinical ethics are aware of the emphasis on philosophers such as Kant and Mill. Hume seems to be relegated largely to the periphery. And this is ironic because the first treatise on medical ethics was authored by an 18th century Scottish physician who relied on Hume to develop his medical ethics. John Gregory, who lived from 1724 to 1773, was an 18th century Scottish physician who taught medicine at the University of Edinburgh and published largely, or published arguably, the first treatise on medical ethics. The foremost scholar on the biography and philosophy of Gregory is Lawrence McCullough, a medical ethicist from Baylor, so much of what I say here is drawn from his work. Gregory was a deist, a philosopher, and a medical educator at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. He was aware of the Hippocratic corpus, but did not treat it as authoritative. And he abhorred what he referred to as the, quote, blind and stupid admiration of Hippocrates. More on that later. He wanted to create a new ethics for a new medicine, and his ethical philosophy would hold that physicians should possess the moral virtues and the capacity for sympathy, tenderness, and steadiness, properties which he took directly from the writings of David Hume. This idea is, is disseminated by way of Gregory's student, Benjamin Rush, who publishes a series of Gregory's lectures. McCullough notes that at the time Gregory was practicing medicine and lecturing on medical ethics at Edinburgh, an unfortunate practice had arisen among physicians. Concerned with their individual mortality rates, physicians who believed a patient was going to die simply labeled them incurable and turned the patient over to clergy, effectively abandoning them. Gregory argued, it is as much the business of a physician to alleviate pain and to smooth the avenues of death when unavoidable as to cure disease. Gregory was also concerned that the practice of medicine had become overly commercial, a trade largely serving the physician's own self-interest, and he opposed commerce in medicine and advocated aggressively against it. Gregory believed the concept of sympathy derived from Hume could be applied at the bedside. Interestingly, McCullough notes that Gregory advanced women as the moral exemplars of sympathy for their representation of the virtues of tenderness and steadiness, which is to say that Gregory's concept of sympathy is gendered feminine. McCullough argues thus that Gregory not only penned the first medical ethics text, but also the first feminine ethics text. I note as an aside here that we should not confuse feminine ethics with feminist ethics. Contemporary feminine ethics is largely associated with philosopher Carol Gilligan's uh, theory of care ethics. Like Gregory, she seems centrally concerned with, vir with virtues or qualities that are gendered feminine and then elevating a recognition of those qualities or virtues as having value equivalent to those we generally associate with men. Feminist ethics is a justice theory centrally concerned with the way the political, economic, and social power is allocated in gender ways. So anyway, uh, despite what we may think of today as perhaps reductionist views about women, Gregory for his time was really quite radical. The father of daughters, he argued they were the equal of any man. He advocated privacy 
as it relates to patients, particularly women, he espoused truth-telling, condemned medical experimentation on sick or dying patients, advocated that physicians must keep an open mind being willing to learn, uh, including willing to learn from their own patients who, quote, have the right to speak where their life or health is concerned. So what does any of this have to do with a sci-fi historical fiction romance novel written in 1991? Let me tell you. So briefly and for context, Outlander and the subsequent series of now nine novels, I believe, and I think there's going to be a 10th, um, are a multi-genre set of novels that tell the story of Claire Beecham Randall Fraser, a British World War II nurse who goes on vacation to a small town in Scotland where she accidentally travels back in time to 1743. She uses her 20th century knowledge of medicine to become a healer in the community of Highlander clans who take her in. In the subsequent novels, she will serve as a nurse, a healer, and eventually a Harvard-educated surgeon for Highlanders, sailors, Native Americans, enslaved persons, immigrants, religious and ethnic minorities, redcoats and regulators, the wealthy and the poor. She does this as herself a complete outsider, an outlander, in both time and place. She is a British woman interacting with Jacobite, Jacobite Highland Scots. She is a 20th century woman in the 18th century. She is a Catholic at a time of Protestant norms in the United Kingdom and America, and she is an orphan. So now we turn to Amy's favorite part where I read to everyone. All right. So very early in the novel, over the course of about three pages, we see the first episode of how Claire approaches clinical care. This scene takes place approximately 30 minutes after Claire has fallen through time. She is confused, cold, scared, considers that she might be on a movie set, but it seems a little bit more realistic than that. And now she is in a cramped cabin with a bunch of Highlanders, some of whom believe she is a British spy. In the midst of this, we experience Claire's first person account of seeing one of the wounded men of the Highland clan whose shoulder has been dislocated when he fell off a horse. She describes the scene in this passage. It's for you, Amy. I gasped, as did several of the men. The shoulder had been wounded. There was a deep, ragged furrow across the top and blood was running freely down the young man's breast. But more shocking was the shoulder itself. A dreadful hump arose on that side and the arm hung at an impossible angle. I'm sure I'm giving nothing away here when I note that Claire will eventually fall in love with and marry this particular person. But her first interaction with him is not from a position of love or attraction or even curiosity. In this first interaction, she claims her professional identity. So she stands in relation to the young man as a clinician to a patient. And further, she does not assert a professional duty or obligation. She certainly does not assert anything resembling the Hippocratic Oath. Instead, she claims the language of emotivism, moved to act by her sympathy for the suffering of another individual. Importantly, she is moved to act without self-interest, stating, I watched in sympathy as one of the other men picked up the young man's arm by wrist and elbow and began forcing it upwards. The angle was quite wrong. It must be causing agonizing pain. Don't you dare do that. All thought of escape submerged in professional outrage. I started forward, oblivious to the startled looks of the men around me. She continues on from there, referring to the man as patient. That is the worst part, I warned, the patient. Suddenly the shoulder gave a soft crunching pop and the joint was back in place. The patient looked amazed. 
The parallel between emotivism and Claire's response to this shoulder injury is made even more stark when we consider the examples and language of David Hume himself in his description of the kinds of events that might give rise to sympathy. This is from a treatise on human nature. Consider the more terrible operations of surgery and the effect upon my mind of observing the laying out of bandages the heating of irons to cauterize severed blood vessels, and the faces of anxiety and concern of both patient and surgical team. I'm going to take a little detour from my script here just to mention that one of the things that's important to Hume um, as he develops this concept of sympathy is the um, way that we feel things, particularly that are directly in front of us. So in the time before photography, um, in the days before camera phones and before, you know, 24 hour news cycles, Hume essentially is of the impression that when you are standing in front of somebody, standing in front of somebody who is suffering, that is going to have the most sort of vivid um, uh, uh, effect on you. That is going to be something that you sympathize with the most, most. So what he's asking us to do here is consider literally watching this all being laid out. Um, you're standing right in front of it. And the more removed you get from that, the harder it is for you to feel sympathy. And so, for example, one of the things that he um, sort of comments on is consider the way we feel sympathy for an event that's right in front of us happening right now versus things that are arguably much, much, much more terrible that happened in the remote past. So, for example, you know, Pompeii, right, the, the uh, volcano in Pompeii, which strikes me if I think about it really hard, like if I peel back my kind of present being, um, I can conceive of as being absolutely horrifying, right, just a terrifying, horrifying event, and yet I have a distance from it because it's remote in time. So again, Hume being separated from uh, you know, the age of photography notes that this is also true with things we can't see. So things we hear about, um, people that are sort of not like us or that are far and distant away, we might feel less sympathy for. And I find um, his theory particularly interesting in today's world where we are constantly inundated with the images of suffering of people who are remote and far away, either through social media or through news. And so I do think that his um, theory uh, can be sort of modified in a way to suggest that um, um, we have an experience of sympathy with people who are maybe unlike us or who are distant from us because we, can, we are so constantly inundated with these images um, presently. So, um, so this, is, this is his example. I do think it's particularly interesting that he puts forward a, a medical example um, of suffering, I kind of like that. And, um, and obviously what's, what we're getting ready for here in this particular example is an amputation. So an 18th century amputation was of course no small matter. As I tell my undergrads, the two skills people needed most in the 18th century for an amputation were speed and strength. And so you know that alone might make us a little uncomfortable. All right. So there's an interesting and relevant contrast to be made with the show adapted from these novels, which consistently references Claire's oath to first do no harm. That's the, that's the Hippocratic oath, right? Um, which I will note, it's not really the Hippocratic oath. It does not appear in the translation of the Hippocratic oath by Adam Francis, which is like the standard translation. Um, but uh, it, it gets sort of used as the, as, as the sort of primary principle guiding the conduct of physicians. First, do no harm. Um, even more so than the four principles, we see a reliance on the oath in medical schools and in books and television and in movies. There are a number of very problematic aspects to the Hippocratic Oath, which I can't adequately cover during this discussion, but you can stop me in the hall if you want like a 30 minute um, diatribe on it. Um, but I tend to agree with Robert Veach, another ethicist, who has commented that this misuse, the misuse of the Hippocratic Oath, this first do no harm, first do no harm, just as the sort of constantly recurring um, uh, clinical maxim, is consistent with the pattern we see in modern times of physicians who are isolated from the substance of serious religious and philosophical scholarship making uninformed reference to the Hippocratic Oath as a short form placeholder for a serious ethical theory. 
ouch. What is more interesting to me though, is that the books that Gabaldon writes do not do this. They do not rely on the Hippocratic Oath or the first do no harm um, principle. The Claire of the books does not routinely utilize Hippocrat the Hippocratic Oath, and she does not really utilize any deontological framework to inform her practice of medicine. I'll provide a little bit of a note on the author. So Dr. Gabaldon holds a PhD in behavioral ecology and started her writing career as an academic and was the editor for Science Software Quarterly and taught in scientific computation for more than a decade before leaving academia to write full time. Those who have read her novels find it hard to believe that any part of them is mere accident. They are impeccably researched. They take four to five years to write each, leaving, leaving those of us who like look forward to these novels with like you know four or five years between them, like when is she gonna get this done? Um, but um, I think of her as being somewhat similar to John Irving as a writer. Both of them write very, very long novels. Um, well, I mean, relatively long compared to maybe some that are written today. Um, I think Gabaldon's longest novel is uh, in the Outlander series is about 1500 pages. And the novel Outlander, which forms the basis of this lecture, the first book is I think 675 pages. So her debut um, novel was 675 pages. Um, so she, she writes these very long novels. Like Irving, she tends to be very concerned with the way that the passage of time affects people. Um, how, to have, well, I shouldn't say passage necessarily, but the, but the way time affects people. For Irving, it is the passage of time. His novels generally take place over a long period of time, and we see how people change and how the events of their life change them. For Gabaldon, she forces, the, she forces these changes by placing people in different time periods, in places where they are sort of the odd man out. Um, and we see the way a particular time period um, either uh, accentuates, augments, um, or, or um, uh, forces a, a particular um, um, awkwardness. So uh, she frequently features characters and plot lines that seem tangential or peripheral, only to have them pop back up 400 pages later as something that was critically important, sometimes a book later, um, where suddenly the character has recurred and they actually matter and mean something. So if we're thinking about um, the, the, um, the author, we have to think about her as somebody who writes at least with some amount of intentionality. And I know that Gabaldon has, has talked about the characters themselves as having a kind of life of their own, where um, she begins to write and then the characters sort of tell her where they're going to go and what they're going to say and what they're going to do. But in terms of the, the events that form the sort of context and background for her characters, those we can assume she has researched um, rather um, um, deeply. So all of this results in a kind of interesting coincidence wherein Hume and Gregory, byproducts of the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment, are the ethical theorists which, are the, which, form the, which the fictional character most um, closely embodies. There's a kind of nice fit between Claire's clinical approach and the culture she ends up in. I can't say whether Gabaldon did this intentionally but it certainly adds additional layers of Scottishness to these novels. More importantly to our discussion, Claire serves as a model for the operationalizability uh, of sympathy in contemporary clinical practice. So um, and as Annie noted, in addition to my work as, a, um, as the Director of Clinical Ethics here. I also teach medical humanities and ethics to medical students and preclinical undergraduates. Almost universally, if asked why these people want to be a physician um, or, a, or a nurse um, or any clinician, they will answer, I want to help people. This ubiquitous claim in personal statements and medical school interviews is so common that we've begun to doubt its authenticity. Yeah, 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 you wanna help people. And I'll notice here, um, this um, article, blog article, um, helping guide students in writing their personal statements for medical school, which notes the anecdotes chosen 
um, demonstrate this individual's response. So they provide like some examples of like things you can say in, in your personal statement. The anecdotes chosen demonstrate this individual's response to the common question, why do you want to be a doctor? While simultaneously making them come across as compassionate, curious, and reflective. The essay articulates a number of key qualities and competencies which go far beyond the common trope I want to be a doctor because I want to help people. But what if we assume that this is simply true, as I believe it is? What would it mean to instruct students in the nature and role of sympathy in clinical treatment? To instruct them, as Gregory would say, in the moral qualities peculiarly required in the character of a physician, the chief of which is humanity. I conclude that Hume's sympathy as applied by Gregory is relevant and important and intuitively understood by physicians as their fundamental obligation. Moreover, the failure to make this explicit in favor of tidy principles creates confusion and moral distress for clinicians who are moved by their patients but have no context for this and do not understand its ethical significance. In Claire, we see this put into practice in Gregory and Hume, we see the possibility of formal instruction on theory, both of which I argue have been improperly excluded from the clinical setting. Thank you. I came in kind of short. I could have, I could have said so much more. Happy to take questions. Or not. Aww. This on, okay. Um, what, this might feel a little loaded, but what role do you see Humean philosophy playing in medical school or in how we teach doctors to be doctors or nurses to be nurses? I don't I, anyone in the clinical context. Well, I think, I mean, I think context is always important, right? So I think that, I think, um, I think Hume is right that people experience this and they don't always recognize it as what they are experiencing. And then I think it's disvalued, this, this idea of feeling sort of sympathy or feeling even a, a sort of softness or a humanness or even a, a suffering or a pain um, um, in response to a, a patient, that that's disvalued. And so then when people feel it, they think they felt something wrong or unprofessional um, or something that is you know, some, somehow problematic. Um, when really, actually, I think it can be that first indication of your actual duty. So, okay, you, you see this suffering, and if we believe that Hume is right, that suffering is an indication, a, a sort of like ethical tickler of some kind, right, then you're motivated to do something about it. And so what is your motive? The hard part, I think, um, that we find in medicine is a lot of times the thing we have to do about it requires real structural change. And um, physicians have historically had... Um, uh, sort of um, a hesitance to enter those kinds of conversations. So, um, so I think understanding that this is a, a, a solid ethical theory, that um, it's based on a kind of empiricism that ostensibly medicine itself is based on, this idea of observation, the, the Bacon method of, of um, developing a theory and then testing the theory. Um, and so they, they should kind of go together um, relatively well, and, and so then sort of understanding what it is that um, one is ex experiencing and feeling. So how would Hume describe moral distress using, how would you describe moral distress using Hume's ideas? Yeah, so I mean, so moral distress would be a sort of central, um, well, so moral distress, for those of you who, who don't know, the current working definition of moral distress is um, the experience of understanding what um, the right thing is to do and not being able to do it, right? So some, some external constraint prevents you from being able to do the thing that you know is right. Um, and so what Hume would say um, is that, that that is that that's sort of like a, a, a really normal, empirically um, provable, identifiable experience that people have in the face of suffering. He would probably identify that as um, I mean, he would identify that as an experience of, of feeling of the of the passions. And one of the things that's important about Hume, I think sometimes people lose this, is that 
he does not believe in passion to the exclusion of reason, right? He believes in passion then, then reflected on. So, um, so this, this is you know, a kind of mediated um, experience. So um, I lost my train of thought a little bit there. So Hume would say that um, uh, moral distress is a, is a very sort of natural and normal part of, of um, the clinical practice. And then he would say that the reason that you have it is because you are a sort of the, the mirror of men's minds. You are able to um, pick up on the external cues of your patients, understanding sort of their, their suffering, and then you feel that. And if the only way that you can dispense with your own suffering is to alleviate the suffering of the other, and you are unable to alleviate the suffering of the other, then you continue to suffer. Right. So, so to, under, to understand Hume is to understand that one, one actually suffers, right? That this is not, it's not an analogy. It's not a cognitive understanding. It's not like, oh, that person is hurting and I wish they weren't. It is a physical feeling of suffering because another person is suffering and you can see that. And so the only way to alleviate one's own suffering is to alleviate the suffering of the other person so that they are no longer suffering. Great. Uh, there's a comment. Oh, I've now I've got a comment and a question. Okay. So somebody said, wonderful. Thank you. I haven't read the books, but I have seen the series. I may read the books now. Oh. And then we have a question saying, what, what is he saying about altruism? I can't remember. Um, I don't remember what he says about altruism. I mean, I there. Yeah. Do you know Bridget? Oh, I mean, is the question whether altruism exists or is it really truly? Mm, I, yeah, I, I can't remember what Hume says about altruism. I have a question about um, the TV series because I'm assuming you have also watched it. I have. So some of us don't have time to read these like hundreds, hundred I don't page novels. You. Okay. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> is you, you talk about the author's intentionality and all of that in the books. Does that translate well to the show? Do you like, can we gain the same sorts of analysis and understanding that you're talking about without reading the books or is reading the books really central? The books are different. And by the, you know, we're like what in series, season seven or something of the show and now the books are really really different than the book than the than the show or they're enough different than the show that some people have, are talking about them as essentially two different things um what i i guess what i will say to your point about the the differences between those from from this sort of perspective of sympathy and hume is that um katrina balf who plays claire is an incredibly good actress actress and she would be able to and does when, when she has the room to effectively communicate the sympathetic physician. Her scripts don't often leave her with the room to do that. So the scripts, I, I don't know whether that's the result of just kind of a narrow thinking in Hollywood or um, just that sort of reliance on the trope of first do no harm, you know, that sort of, which is easy, right? Like everybody's familiar with it. They don't really know where it came from or what it means. Um, but, um, but they rely on that pretty heavily in the show. So much so that sometimes it's like, this doesn't even really make sense in this context. Um, but uh, in the book, it's really not. And I only use the example of the, those, that first interaction, but you actually see this sort of repeatedly for the, her character throughout the books. One of the things that I, I didn't get into because I thought I wouldn't have time, ironically enough, um, is that, um, the series is called Outlander. The idea is this woman who's completely outside of, of the culture. Um, and she provides um, care and treatment to other people who are also largely outside the culture, right? Including the Highlanders themselves who are sort of the disfavored um, group in the, in the United Kingdom at that time. And so she provides care and treatment to Native Americans. She provides care and treatment to enslaved people. She provides like all of these different people. Um, and because of that, I mean, I think that she she's really very much um, moving from a perspective of seeing a person in front of her and feeling moved to sort of to sort of address their pain and suffering and to care from them for them and this sort of first do no harm thing 
Um, it's even sort of historically inaccurate for the time that she goes to medical school where the Hippocratic Oath was not a regular um, part of the practice of becoming a physician. It wouldn't have been something that she was regularly exposed to. So, um, so I think that answers your question. But, um, but yes, yeah, she there's in the books, she clearly is a sympathetic physician. In the show, she easily could be because she's a talented enough actress. Um, and, um, and there's just not really the opportunity to do that in the scripts. Okay, so I asked if the person would um, elaborate more on the question. Would we deduce that sympathy then arises when we recognize ourselves in the suffering patient, or are we simply altruistic, or the feel good we experience by doing good? Oh, so, oh, so um, we do recognize we do recognize ourselves in in the other. I mean, that is that one of the ideas of sympathy, right? Is that you see that first relations you see in the other person. Um, something you yourself could experience. And so that, that is there. Um, I, I hesitate to get too far down the, the altruism rabbit hole, other than to say that one of the most compelling arguments that I've heard in favor of the existence of altruism, so for those of you who, are, who don't know, there are people who argue that altruism is impossible because of the good feeling you get, right? So you get a good feeling when you do something good. Um, and the rebuttal to that that I find the most persuasive is the notion that you wouldn't get the good feeling if you didn't care about the other person. And so the concern for the other actually precedes the good feeling. And so altruism is possible. When you are doing something, you are doing it truly for another person. And the good feeling you get from doing that is a sort of secondary effect um, or a secondary occurrence and not the target of, of your behavior. So hopefully that kind of answers the question. All right, any more questions in-house? Okay, Jane, thank you so much thank for you. presenting today. Have fun in Scotland presenting this and we will see everyone next month. Thank you.